I just feel like dancing with that, don't you guys? Yeah. What's up? How we doing? Yeah. You guys are awesome. I am stoked to be here, and I hope you guys are having fun too. If it's your first time to One Students, welcome. You're a part of a very rowdy, funny-looking, strange group of people. But... We're better because you're here, so hopefully you're having fun, and um, if you haven't, I know Bailey and Chloe just talked about signing up for groups, but if you haven't signed up for groups yet, you need to because you're going to miss out, and I don't want you to miss out, you know? I don't want you to get to the end of this year and then come back to me and be like, Alex, how come you didn't make me sign up for groups? Because I really missed out. If you're not in a group, you're going to miss out on so many, so many nights, so many fun activities, so many great discussions. And that's one thing that is really um, important here at One Students. We don't just want to have fun. We don't want, just want to like have an event. We actually want to challenge each other and grow intellectually and actually understand and process and figure out why it is that we are like pursuing to be like Jesus. We don't want to just play church. We want to be the church and actually make a difference. And that's what happens at small groups. So if you haven't joined a small group yet and you're on the fence, let me just kick you over the fence and get on that side and join us. Join the dart side. Bailey's like, I'm the dart master. And I'm like, the dark master? That sounds a little <laughs> sick. But um, <laughs> dart. Okay, no shooting the, no shooting the communicator. So, <laughs> um, You guys having fun? Make some noise if you're having some fun. Awesome. Who here is enjoying school? One, two, three, four. Who is ready for Thanksgiving break? All of you. Yes, thank you. You're my people. I could not stand sitting in class, especially when the weather was nice outside. And right now, the weather is pretty good. It's sweater weather in the morning, and then instantaneously, once 10 o'clock hits, you regret putting the sweater on. Don't you? Anybody else regretted putting a sweater on? Because you're sweating and you're like, you're pitting out and you're like, I can't take it off now because everybody know I'm going to be pitting. And yeah, this struggle is real. Um, how many of you have uh, a good teacher in your schedule? You have a, a good teacher, a fun teacher. How many of you have a very boring teacher in your schedule? Yep, lots of you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, and that's just the nature of it. You know, some teachers are, not all teachers are created equal. And uh, hopefully you're being respectful to them all, though. That's the, that's the important thing. Because they all are there for your benefit. Um, all right. There is a ton of groups, so sign up for groups. And I'm rambling on. So tonight we're going to be testing our awareness. So I'm going to queue up a video to really see how aware you guys are. So watch this. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Isn't that, like, crazy? The first time I watched that, I'm like, there's no way I missed the moonwalking bear. And sure enough, we all missed the moonwalking bear. How many of you have seen that before? Okay, a few of you. Yeah, I had seen it before, and I thought about playing it tonight. I'm like, should I? And I'm like, well, it's really grainy, so you can tell it's a really old video. So I'm like, majority is a lot of these people haven't even seen it because it's so old. So I'm glad that it was a surprise to a lot of you. If you had seen it before, thanks for playing along and not spoiling it for the rest of us. Um, so Natasha's side of the family is all Russian. She has a lot of siblings. She has five siblings. Five siblings, three brothers, and then some biological brothers and or some some um, brother-in-laws that are married uh, into the family. And uh, her family likes to get together for food. And, and we sit around the table and we talk and we drink tea. It's very strange. Lots of cookies and pastries. Um, and I I you know I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm married to her, so I sit 
at the dinner table, and they all speak Russian together. And I have grown up in Russia, so I speak Russian. I'm almost fluent. I wouldn't say I'm, like, really fluent because my grammar is kind of bad, but I get a lot of what's going on. But my, my brother-in-laws, Natasha's brothers, love to joke. They love to tell practical jokes. They love to tell funny, um, you know, humor. But they use slang in these jokes. And a lot of times, about 50% of the time, I totally miss the punchline. And, and everybody around the table is like laughing and belly laughing and like looking around and they got tears in their eyes. And I'm like, <laughs> 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 just praying to God that nobody notices that I don't get the joke, right? You ever been there before? You, you punchline goes right over your head and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> don't, yeah, don't realize. Anyway, and it's, it's the worst feeling ever when you miss something obvious, right? Have you ever missed something obvious? Um, I remember in the seventh grade, how many seventh graders here tonight make some noise? <laughs> Come on, seventh grade showing up. I like it. Uh, I was in the seventh grade at Lakes Middle School in Coeur d'Alene, um, and my teacher, my social studies teacher, his name was Mr. Paul Ivey. Now, Mr. Paul Ivey went to the same church I did, which is not always a good thing if you're a class clown, which I might have been. Um, and Mr. Paul Ivey, he was about 60-some years old, old as dirt, pretty much. And uh, in my eyes, as a seventh grader, and clearly if you're 60s, I'm sorry, don't, don't hate me because it was just my perspective. And he had bottle cap glasses. I mean, like Coke bottle cap, like the bottom of the Coke bottle. You would take that off, and that was his lens, well, you know, like bottle cap glasses. And they were just as big around as the bottom of a Coke bottle. And Mr. Paul Ivey, I... I I was convinced that he was blind. And so one day I decided to take this to the test. I was bored in class, and he was at the front of the class. I was in the middle of the classroom sitting at my table and thinking of different ways to distract my classmates. And I had a great idea. I was going to mimic Mr. Ivy by, with my hand. Like, you know, I was going to play puppet with Mr. Ivy's lecture. And right beside my head, I thought, he can't see this. This isn't that obvious. And, um, and so, you know, and obviously kids are laughing and kind of cringing at the same time. It's like watching a train wreck. You can't look away, but you want to look away because it's traumatic. And you're like, what is happening? Anyway, so I'm doing this in class. And Mr. Paul Ivey stops talking. And I'm like, what's, it, what's, it, what's going on? And he's coming up right next to my seat. And he says, Mr. Hall. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Go out to the hallway and wait for me there. And so I got up, picked up all my dignity, what was left of it, and walked out to the hallway. And I sat in the hallway outside the classroom until the class was done. It was a long time to think about my actions. And then, of course, Mr. Ivy talked to me afterwards and then um, talked to my mom at church on Sunday. And, you know, that, all, that always goes well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I thought what I was doing wasn't very obvious, but it clearly was obvious. And, uh, you know, like I didn't realize the obvious re repercussions for my actions. And, and I missed something very obvious. And, and so many times in life we can go through life and miss obvious things. So tonight we're going to be talking about what we notice and what we see and the things that we don't notice, the things that we don't necessarily See, and, and it's so important that we recognize that we see everything, but we don't really understand everything. And so uh, in, in 2008, I was a college student. I was going to North Idaho College, which is in Coeur d'Alene, and I was in this speech class. I was, uh, in, and the tests for this speech class were um, speeches to your other classmates and to the teacher, um, and you had to do it on video. And so one morning before one of these tests for this class, um, yeah, I was going to Best Buy and I bought a CD. And you probably don't know what a CD is, but a CD, they used them back in the day. And so they, this video recorder used a CD and I was... Um, and getting one of these CDs to put in the video camera so that I would pass the class and get a good grade on my speech class. And so I was pulling out of the Best Buy parking lot that morning. And instead of stopping, like you're supposed to do at stop signs, that's why they're called stop signs, I just rolled through. I just kind of glanced and looked at my peripherals, and I just rolled through the stop sign. And what I didn't realize is there was a minivan. Who drives minivans anyways? 
Ben. <laughs> There was a minivan in, like, in the way, so you know how your car has the A pillar that holds the front windshield in? It was, it was moving at the same pace that I was rolling, and I missed it. It was obvious, and if I would have stopped, I would have seen it, but I rolled through, and I proceeded to scratch and to scrape and to dent every single panel of that minivan as it passed by. And the minivan, the audacity of the minivan driver, she took my bumper off my whole car. I know, it's evil. Some people. And uh, so then, not only did I miss my speech class and my test, not only did the police show up and give me a big ticket, not only did I um, have to, uh, you know, claim something on my insurance, but also I had a broken car, and I had to get my car fixed. And I just wished that I would have slowed down, taken the time to look around and see what was obviously there. And sometimes in life, if we're not careful, we go through every season, we go through every class period, we go through every um, sporting event, we go through everything that we we are in life and we don't slow down long enough to look around and to see what is obviously right in front of us. And, uh, you know, sometimes we need to stop and slow down. And, and, and I think it's important, more than the things around us, we see the people around us. It's so important to see the people that are around you in life because really people matter the most. People matter the most. And, 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 if we, if we aren't noticing one another, we can actually really hurt one another. Have you ever been rejected before? Come on, all of you should be raising your hands. I've been rejected. Doesn't it hurt? I mean, it's painful when somebody, like, looks past you. I was talking with Stephen McNally about this same thing on Sunday, how, you know, it just kind of, like, irritates you when you're like, hello, I'm right here. But they look beyond you because they don't see the obvious person that is standing right in front of you. And sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes, um, you know, you just get ignored because you're not obviously, you know, like, you know, like right there. In Mark chapter 6, we read a story, and if you have your Bible, you can open up your notes to Mark chapter 6. If you haven't downloaded the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, I would encourage you, go to your app store, Google Play store, and download the YouVersion Bible app, um, and, and uh, open up to Mark chapter 6. It's, um, we're going to read a story about Jesus, who is teaching thousands of people. Now, I want you to realize, thousands of people, there's about... I don't, Probably about 65, 70 of us in here tonight. Uh, times that by like 10, right? That's about how many people, um, is that right? Is that my quick math? 70 times, no, times that by 100, right? It's about 5,000 men and their families. So lots of people, huge crowd. Jesus is teaching them. And the, the Bible says that it became kind of late in the afternoon. And the people were very spiritually hungry. They were receiving what Jesus was teaching them in, in spiritual truths. But they were also becoming very physically hungry. How many of you are hungry tonight? You, you could eat like a lot. Well, we're going to eat later and have some snacks in the lobby. But um, what happens when you get hungry? Hangry, come on, yeah. You get a little impatient, you get a little hangry. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing called the mob mentality, but that when people get together in a big crowd and, and then like they're hangry, bad things can happen. And so the disciples said to Jesus, like, hey, Jesus, you know what? Uh, it's kind of getting late and we're all kind of hungry and a little hangry. We should go somewhere else. We should take ourselves and go find something to eat away from the crowd. And so Jesus and the disciples, they get on this boat and they set sail to go find a place where they can eat and they can rest. But the crowd follows the boat. And when they get to the place where they were landing, they see the crowd was there again. And they're like, oh, man, this is quite the predicament. And so Jesus has um, awareness. He has he's observed there's a need for people. And so he begins to teach them again. But the disciples are like, hey, Jesus, the people are still hungry. They're still getting a little hangry. And Jesus is like, well, um, feed them. And they're like, uh, we, with what? We, we would have to work, they said, for months to earn enough money to pay for the food of all these people. And Jesus asks this question. 
What do you have? What do you have? And if you're taking notes, you need to write that down. What do I have? What do I have? And this is the question that Jesus is asking us tonight. What do we have? And so the disciples went and they looked at what they had and they found five, everybody say five, five loaves of bread. I have five loaves of bread. Five loaves of bread and two fish. Come on, who likes Swedish fish? I didn't want to bring some smelly fish up here. Fish is nasty. <laughs> but Swedish fish, now we're talking. And they're like, hey, Jesus, we got five loaves. Ah, oh, you get the picture. <laughs> five loaves of bread <laughs> and two fish. And this is it. And Jesus, uh, we're going to pick up in Mark chapter 6, verse 41. He says, or the Bible says, Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish He looked up to heaven and he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread. Come on, catch. You guys coordinated. He kept giving the bread to the disciples who then dispersed it into the crowd. He also divided the fish. Come on, somebody. You excited about it? (laughs) Okay, okay. (laughs) Uh, Here's what I'm going to do. You have to sit and listen to the rest of the story, and then I'll say go, and y'all can come up here and have some fish, okay? Okay. Um, He then distributed the fish. Here we go. That way it doesn't get all dirty on the floor, okay? Uh, This floor is freshly painted. Um, They all ate... Everybody say all. All. They all ate as much as they wanted. And after the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish, a total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. I'm blown away by the ability of Jesus to take what we have, however limited our resources, however limited our abilities. He takes what we have, and if we will be open-handed with what God has given us, he is faithful to bless it and to use it to bless others. And so, all right, go. I know there's lots of people hungry. Hey, share, please. Share with your friends. Thank you. Connor needs one. Can we give one to Connor, my boy right here? Come on. Hook, Hook Connor up. If you got multiples. Anyway. Thanks, Caleb. You're a good man. All right. Who wants bread? Here you go. All right. That's it. Here you go, Caleb. All right. That was fun. I share this story with us tonight because so many times we see, we see an obvious need, right? You see somebody, you see, you see an obvious need in your family, you see an obvious need in our world, um, at school or at our workplace, and we, we see that it's a big need. It's a huge need. And, and what we do is we look at what we have, and we say, oh man, it's not enough. And so instead of doing something, what we do is nothing. We say, well, when I have enough, then I will do something. And, and this is not what Jesus is teaching us through this story. This is totally opposite of what Jesus is teaching the disciples in this story. Jesus is teaching the disciples to do three things. To do, one, see a need. Number two, see what I have. And number three, share what I have and believe God for the rest. And this is such a profound um, principle that we need to learn firsthand. Even if we don't have enough, even if I don't have enough in my ability right now, we can't, be, we can't do nothing. You and I cannot do nothing and claim to be like Jesus. You hear me this, morning, this evening? We cannot do nothing and claim to be a Christ follower. Christ followers need to be like Jesus and do something. We have to be men and women of action. And that requires doing those three things. We see a need, we see what we have, and we do something and we believe God for the rest. We see a need, we see what we have, we do something and we believe God for the rest. And if you're taking notes, 
Write those three things down. We need to, we need to see, we need to be, uh, there's obvious needs all around us. And we need to see those in need, and we need to do something, and God will do the rest. The truth is that so many times we just don't notice. We become kind of immune to the needs around us. We become a little calloused to the, the, the needs that are in our lives. So do we have the perspective to see others? And if I'm being honest, I don't. I don't have the perspective of Jesus yet. I'm working towards it. We're all working towards having this perspective that Jesus is, is, is teaching us about, like to see others and to do something. And, and as we close tonight, I'm, I'm, we're going to close a little different. We're going to have uh, Jenna come back up here and, and just play um, with, the, with the guitar. And I, I really want to close tonight's message with some, some reflection, some time where we think in personally, individually, me right now, in my life, tomorrow as I go back to school, tomorrow as I wake up and I interact with my family, right now, personally, in my life, what is obvious that I'm just not noticing? What is there that I need to see? What is there that Jesus is, is, is encouraging me to notice and to do something with what he's given me? There is always something for us to do. So with every head bowed, every eye closed tonight, I just want to take a few moments as Jenna plays lightly on the guitar to ask God, God, what is it in my life that's there, it's obvious, and you want me to notice? Who is in my life that is there that needs to be noticed? Who is it that you are calling me to go out towards and to bless in your name? So just take a little bit of time to self-evaluate. I love this song, Reckless Love, because on the bridge it talks about how there's no shadow, he won't light up. And I believe there's some shadows in our life that are, are blocking our perspective. They're keeping us from seeing what God wants us to see. And so I'm, I'm going to pray tonight that God would light up the shadows in our life so that we could see others, so that we could put others first in our life, just like Jesus is teaching us to do. Jesus, I pray that you would help us to, to see those in our life that are right in front of us, that need us, that need us to be generous, that need us to be caring, to put others first. And I pray, God, that our schools would be different because, Lord, you're lighting up our perspective. You're lighting up our, our hearts to see others the way that you see us. And I pray, Jesus, that um, you would help us to just be honest with ourselves and, and selfless like your word instructs us to do. Philippians in the Bible 2, 3 through 4 says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others, but be humble Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take interests in others too. As I was preparing for, for the time that we have to close tonight, I know in my life I try to impress others. I try to like do things that are impressive. But the Bible is saying don't try so hard to impress others with your abilities and your, your talents or you know, like, you, you know, what you have. But but. Think about others over yourself. Put them first. And, and I think the, the beautiful thing about this scripture is that we want to impress others. And honestly, the most impressive thing we can do is to be like Jesus. The most impressive thing that we can do is to actually model who Jesus is and to care for others. And so if you want to impress people in your life, if you want to impress that, that boy or that girl or, you know, that friend Show them who Jesus is. And I know, I know they will be impressed by that. Would you stand with me tonight? I think it's a good exercise for us to, uh, to say these words. It's not about me. It's not about me. So let's repeat those. It's not about me. Let's do it again. It's not about me. It's not about me. 
So many times we live in a me-centered world where it's all about me, 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 what, what makes me feel better, what makes me look better. But really in the kingdom of God and what Jesus is teaching us, it's really about others first. It's about saying, no, 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 after you, you first, not me first. So as we close, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here tonight and this is uh, a new concept, like being others first, not me first, but putting others first like Jesus um, is teaching us. If, if you're new to the faith or you're new to this whole idea of Jesus and, and you're open to saying, yes, Jesus, I want to be like you. I want, to, I want to learn from you. I want you to be my Lord. If that's you tonight and you want to just take a step of faith in your journey and say, I want to be like Jesus. I want to live for him. I'm going to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus tonight by just simply raising your hand and believing in your heart that he's the Lord of your life. So if that's you, right now on the count of three, just raise your hand. One, two, three. If that's you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? It's the best. I see that hand. Anybody else? Awesome. It's the best. I see that hand. I see. Nobody, there's no other greater decision that we can make. All right, you can put your hands down. And we're all going to pray this prayer together. Um, and it's just simply a prayer that says, God, I'm not enough. I need you to help me to be more like you. And I commit to live for you all the days of my life. So would you repeat after me? Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of all my mistakes. And help me to make better decisions by putting others first and being like you. I commit to live my life for you from here on out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, can we just celebrate? Yeah.